okay so Yeah. So I'll uh, start with the quote that being updated is not important, growing updated is. And uh, for us clinicians, it is very, very important that we keep up with the times that we are living in. What we learned five years back becomes irrelevant just five years after and maybe minutes after that also. A gentle request to kindly mute those uh, who want to say anything. We may have, yeah. So now, what we are seeing, <clears throat> we are seeing the tubal ectopic and morbidity associated with that. Pregnancy of unknown location, emergency admissions and conditions related to, to tubal ectopic. So it is huge and especially when we are missing the diagnosis. Along with this, we noticed a paradigm shift. Initially, we all opted for open surgeries. Now we are coming down to minimally invasive. From minimally invasive surgeries, options of radical versus conservative treatments are present now. Even we have moved towards medical management more and there are newer horizons that we are seeing. And now even without medical management, Expected man, expected management, which uh, just was flowing out of the window at some point of time, is now gaining importance as well as um, uh, as well as novelty and acceptance nowadays amongst the clinicians. More stress is being laid on prevention now, and strategies are being formulated so that we don't see more of ectopics in our OPDs nowadays. So, what is the problem in? Uh, uh, that we have to tackle. On one side, there is increased incidence of ectopic because we are using more artificial reproductive technologies, which documentedly gives rise to a bit more ectopic pregnancies. Rising age, age of marriage, increased incidence of PID, more surgeries, pelvic, tubal, and everything. And yes, uh, smoking, active and passive both. On the other hand, we are making increased diagnosis of ectopic. We are making earlier diagnosis of ectopic. We have better treatments. We have reduced mortalities and improved fertility. So the balance is still like equal on both the sides. We are not yet uh, on that side of the road that we can say that we have mitigated this challenge named ectopic completely. So first and foremost, what has changed in making the diagnosis? Yeah, that if we talked about triad of three A's, amenorrhea, abdominal pain, and abnormal vaginal spotting. Along with this, add history of contraception, especially emergency oral the uh, over the counter contraceptive pills. It is now well established fact that OTC pills, especially when taken very early in uh, gestation, can give rise to tubal ectopics. Wherever there is history of ART and ovulation induction, agents and patient is coming with amenorrhea and is spotting, our antennas should be on high alert. They can present a spot from a spotting to heavy hemorrhage nowadays because initially we thought, and this was taught to us, that ectopic pregnancy classically presents with the spotting, but we have seen cases with heavy, uh, heavy uterine hemorrhage in cases of ectopic pregnancy. They can present as post-abortal hemorrhage, continuous spotting, bleeding. Patient got her uterus evacuated outside without even being uh, knowing that she was a case of ectopic pregnancy or maybe a case of heterotopic pregnancy and she is continuously bleeding. And this is one paper which I would like to quote, progesterone only emergency contraception in ectopic pregnancy. And since then, the literature has continuously been rising to report that uh, emergency contraception pills can give rise to more incidence of ectopic pregnancy. So when we have this triad of vaginal spotting, pain and amenorrhea, we should have high clinical suspicion for the condition. We should look into the risk factors that may give rise to ectopic pregnancy and any reproductive age group, female coming with missed period or even without missed period, the history is suspicious 
you should suspect ectopic pregnancy. Second is what we have to take care after making a diagnosis to provide respectful care to these patients. There should be careful choice of words because pregnancy is a good news, but not for all. And especially if it has turned out into an ectopic gestation, then it becomes a bit more weird. Then second, uh, these are usually unplanned pregnancies. So we should be uh, carefully evaluating for that, uh, that feature. And sometimes after when uh, the patient has taken fertility treatment, has taken ART, and you break that the pregnancy has turned out to, to be uh, an ectopic pregnancy, we have to follow the guidelines for breaking bad news because this is really a special area. And uh, a triage area should have a special room designated for breaking such bad news to the patient and spikes protocols, which have been highlighted over there, uh, uh, are reflected for the benefit of the audience. So we should be following these spikes guidelines and this is now the international protocol. Third is what has changed in imaging. So we were reliant on ultrasound from initial days only. Although when I was doing PG, we used to do caldosynthesis to diagnose ectopic pregnancy. But now TBS is the first line of investigation. Even if the patient is having bleeding or spotting, we can perform TBS and can get, get a better yield as far as diagnosis is concerned. So we got to have focus that is point of care ultrasound in every emergency and triage area. That is the demand of the time. And if we do not have, we have to justify MRI can be done wherever there is doubt in diagnosis because ectopic also is not such an easy entity that every radiologist, however experienced they are, can give you an uh, instant diagnosis. I remember one of my cases where seven ultrasounds were done within a span of uh, uh, three days, but the diagnosis of uh, ectopic was not made. And believe me, best of the best radiologists uh, had a look over her ultrasound. We can use other backup modalities like 3D ultrasound, 4D ultrasound, and maybe hysteroscopy in a select cases, especially where congenital uterine malformations are associated and we are suspecting maybe a coronal pregnancy. So let us have a look at what is the gain of adding MRI to TBS. TBS is giving us a sensitivity of 93.9%. MRI is giving 95%. TBS is giving us a specificity of 99.9% .9 and MRI is 100% specific. So in, I think, every clinician's opinion, TBS becomes the investigation of first choice and MRI should be given uh, only in selected cases. Now, laparoscopy, which was earlier considered as a gold standard for making the diagnosis, that C and say it is not to be done just for making the diagnosis. And caldosynthesis is also not supported by the evidence that we can do or we should do routinely caldosynthesis to make or refute a diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. So we have to widen the horizon, empty uterus, extra uterine sac, presence of anechoic fluid, heterotropic pregnancy as a possibility, probe tenderness, even if we are not able to see anything and presence of fluid inside the uterus, inside the cervical canal or outside the uterus, especially in pouch of Douglas area. Extra uterine G-sac with or without fetal pole or yolk sac or cardiac activity and having a tubal ring, which is hallmark because of the increased color Doppler uptake makes up for a confirmed diagnosis of uh, ectopic pregnancy. Now, sometimes you may get a report of ultrasound, which is labeled as presence of complex adnexal cell mass. There is no mention of gestational sac, fetal pole, yolk sac, anything in that. The radiologist will just say, hey, I can see a complex adnexal cell mass, but ask radiologist, or I think majority of them must be doing that. Is it moving independently of ovary? If it is, this complex adnexal cell mass is moving independently of ovary, we should suspect ectopic pregnancy in such situation. Presence of moderate amount of anechoic fluid or any amount of ecogenic fluid, again, the uh, index of suspicion becomes more high. So anechoic fluid in moderate amount and ecogenic fluid in any amount, however mild it is, we should think that uh, ectopic may be a possibility. Double decidual sac sign, having a gestational sac less than 8 millimeter without yolk sac or fetal pole, 
yes, again, it gives us uh, uh, an insight that you might be looking at an ectopic pregnancy. So this extra uterine G-sac without fetal pool, yolk sac, cardiac activity, and having a tubal ring is known as bagel sign, which is uh, asked in NEET PG quite uh, many times if the students are here. And uh, it, bagel sign is confirmatory or a hallmark feature for ectopic pregnancy. The differential diagnosis in such cases becomes corpus luteal cyst. And here also I would like to uh, narrate this incidence. My first laparotomy, considering or thinking that I'm operating a case of ectopic pregnancy was a ruptured corpus luteum cyst. Again, the patient was going fertility treatment in our unit and I felt really bad for the patient. And I could see thin yellowish fluid which came out of an adjacent uh, double corpus luteum from it. There was nothing inside the patient, but it was uh, it got ruptured, slight amount of hemoperitoneum, but we opened her up. So uh, this should always be in our mind whenever we are uh, seeing such cases in ultrasound. So, But how to identify corpus luteum? I think that differential becomes less important nowadays owing to the improved sensitivity of ultrasound. The corpus luteum is thin walled. It is less ecogenic and contains clear fluid. So what are the points of contest here? First is <clears throat> endometrial interrogation. So uh, what do we mean by inter endometrial interrogation? We must remember that earlier we were uh, doing routine DNC or a curettage for finding out chorionic villi. Ke chorionic villi present hai, ke chorionic villi absent hai. Now we don't have to do, uh, we don't have to do that. So we have to just look for one trilaminar pattern of uh, endometrium. It may have a pseudo gestational sac or decidual cyst, which may be confused with a pregnancy. And this endometrial pattern is significantly correlated with the thin endometrium and that an endometrial strip of less than 8 millimeter might result either in ectopic pregnancy or spontaneous abortion. So thickness of endometrium and the pattern of endometrium is very important. And uh, I'll discuss here that along with this, we should be looking for the single index. Single index means we combine discriminatory zone, endometrial thickness, and the trilaminar pattern of endometrium to diagnose ectopic pregnancy and differentiate it from intrauterine pregnancy. It has shown to be uh, better sen uh, sensitive and specific as compared to either using a uh, syrup ultrasound wale pattern or using discriminatory zone to differentiate between ectopic and intrauterine pregnancy. So what is discriminatory zone, which we were so fondly using till now, and we are still using it. Discriminatory zone is a beta SCG level at which gestational sac of intrauterine pregnancy should be seen with ultrasound, confirming intrauterine pregnancy and essentially ruling out ectopic pregnancy. So intrauterine gestational sac should be visualized at a transvaginal ultrasound with transvaginal ultrasound having a beta SCG level of 1000 to 2000 international unit per data. And in trans abdominal yeah. ultrasound, beta SCG more than 6500 international unit per liter confirms that this is going to be an, uh, uh, like we should be able to visualize a gestational sac in this case. Now, this was the thing that we were using earlier that is discriminatory zone. But a famous hai aur bahut help bhi karta hai. But along with discriminatory zone, if we add one endometrial thickness, ki wo agar less than 8 millimeter hai. And trilaminar pattern, ki trilaminar pattern of endometrium hai, less than 8 millimeter hai, or discriminatory zone se out hai, so then we are probably seeing a case of ectopic pregnancy. And as we can see, sensitivity is 96.3% and specificity is around 83%. One, uh, Entity cervical ectopic, <clears throat> which is commonly confused with incomplete abortion. So let's uh, discuss this point also here. This is usually diagnosed as incomplete or inevitable abortion. Patient becomes bleeding profusely. It accounts for less than 15% of total ectopic gestation. And sometimes life-threatening hemorrhage may ensue. Sometimes we have to resort for hysterectomy. There was one case report where thinking that it, this is a case of, uh, you know, uh, incomplete abortion, unyielding post-abortal hemorrhage, hysterectomy was done and histopathological specimen revealed that this was a case of cervical pregnancy. 
So uh, what are the signs that we should be looking for differentiating cervical ectopic from incomplete abortion? First and foremost is empty uterus for any ectopic. Second is a barrel-shaped cervix. Now the cervix is closed at internal loss and closed at external loss and balloons in between. That, thus it shape, uh, takes the shape of a barrel. A gestational sac present below the level of uterine arteries. So at the level of internal loss, uterine artery blood flow will be seen. If we see gestational sac, which is taking up color, having probably cardiac activity also, then uh, we should be thinking that we are probably looking at a, a cervical ectopic pregnancy here. Now, absence of the sliding sign. What is sliding sign? When pressure is applied to cervix using the probe, the gestational sac slides against the endocervical canal in miscarriage. Because it is only left And the moment probe is put on cervix, that sac will go uh, below the, the pressure of the probe. And this is known as sliding sign. So this sliding sign is not present or is absent in an implanted cervical pregnancy because that's an intact pregnancy having its attachment and it will not slide against the pressure of the probe. And the final sign is having blood flow around the gestational sac on color doctor. So these are five criteria for making a diagnosis of cervical ectopic pregnancy. Now we should be keeping them more in mind because there is reported increased incidence of cervical ectopic nowadays. Reason exactly is not known. The different researchers have re reported according to their etiology and areas. So this entity that is cesarean scar ectopic, everybody will agree that it has increased. And uh, we had great discussions on some online and WhatsApp forums why it is increasing and what the obstetrician should be doing so that this is uh, decreasing in uh, dec should decrease in incidence. So, what are the criteria for diagnosing cesarean scar ectopic? One is empty uterus, as I said, for every ectopic with clearly visualized endometrium, empty cervical canal here, and gestational sac implanted in the lower anterior uterine segment at the presumed site of cesarean section incision scar, thin or absent myometrium between the gestational sac and the bladder, and majority of the cases have a myometrium thickness of less than 5 millimeters. Because sometimes, you know, an inevitable abortion may also be seen uh, in, into the lower uterine cavity below the inter, uh, above the internal os. So how do we differentiate whether this is an inevitable abortion or a cesarean is correct topic is myometrial thickness. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, it will not be having color when we put color through the uh, inevitable abortion. It will not be taking up that, but a cesarean is correct topic will be doing that. There are three types of cesarean scar ectopics. First one is, that is type 1, it grows towards uterine cavity. Type 2 grows uh, towards uterine serosa and bladder. And type 3 is completely inside the scar. And it is embedded into the uh, scar area myometrium. And myometrium is usually less than 3 millimeter. And um, I'm sure now we, we all know what are the implications. The ectopic which grows toward uterine cavity may have two fate. It grows normally and this placenta gets attached to the scar and gives rise to placenta accreta spectrum. Second is this type 2 which grows towards uterine serosa and bladder. So it gets implanted, grows outside and eventually it ruptures leading to the scar site rupture and hemoperitoneum. And the topic which is sitting completely into the myometrium, having very thin myometrium, again, it bleeds a lot. It grow, it tries to grow inside it, but it tends to rupture earlier because it's not growing and not having space to grow. So uh, these are the ultrasonological pictures of such uh, pregnancies. There is another entity where... There might be some confusion, might be not, but it So these three things. And uh, I will be very honest in putting that when I was a learner, I thought all three are same. Interstitial, angular or coronal pregnancy, so we But what is interstitial pregnancy? First, this is a blastocyst which is implanting into, into the interstitial portion of tube. Angular pregnancy is embryo is implanted medial to uterotubal junction in the lateral angle of uterine cavity. 
नीदर एन एक टॉपिक नॉ डेंजरस सो एंगुलर एक टॉपिक एक्चुअली एक टॉपिक प्रेग्नेंसी है कॉर्नुअल प्रेग्नेंसी इज इन द हॉर्न ऑफ यूट्रस ऑफ अ बाइकॉर्नुअल यूट्रस इट इज ऑल्सो नॉट एन एक टॉपिक प्रेग्नेंसी The gestational sac is located outside the uterine cavity, uh, and the interstitial part of fallopian tube is seen adjoining the lateral aspect of uterine cavity and gestational sac. And if we are lucky enough, we can find another cornu also. So, so how to see? This is angular pregnancy sitting over here in the lateral angle. Interstitial pregnancy in the interstitial portion of tube. This is true ectopic, and this is cornual pregnancy in one of the horns of uh, a bicornuate uterus. So, angular pregnancy is distinguished from interstitial. So, we have to distinguish this angular from interstitial. By the embryo position, we are lateral uterine enlargement of an angular pregnancy. See, this is angular pregnancy. This is enlarging from here. it displaces the round ligament upwards and outwards so round ligaments becomes taut and comes here whereas interstitial tubal pregnancy is located lateral to round ligament the round ligament aram se idhar hai and no such displace is seen in interstitial pregnancy and this is a commonly asked question uh, to the post graduates especially and uh, for clinicians it is important to distinguish between the two next entity is ovarian ectopic um, till date i have seen two ovarian ectopics maybe like your and like i don't know what so we use the spielberg criteria given way back in 1878 so what are those criteria and quite relevant nowadays also fallopian tube as the affected site must be intact so there should not be any fallopian tube uh, rupture or anything first and foremost criteria is that second is the fetal sac must occupy the position of ovary and not just dangling around along with ovary third is the ovary must be connected to the uterus by ovarian ligament and ovarian tissue must be located in the sac wall all these features are essential for confirmation of early ovarian pregnancy again they, uh, they can also rupture quite early and uh, and uh, what is happening over here is that the differential diagnosis is very difficult to make and unless there is cardiac activity fetal pool yolk sac they might be confused only with corpus luteum or an enlarged or uh, growing uh, cyst of the ovary so that is why it is important to for us to know uh, what are the points that we have to see while diagnosing a case of ovarian ectopic majority of the reports are that ovarian ectopics were diagnosed on the table during the protomy or laparoscope fifth is pregnancy of unknown location and here discriminatory zone utilization is very important it is actually not a diagnosis but just a, a initial part of workup and it should prompt us for search of actual site of ectopic pregnancy serial beta hcg surveillance is very important in these patients and the patients should be warned about signs of danger fainting shoulder tip pain and anxiety beta hcg but alone should never be used to reassure the site of pregnancy ki beta hcg theek thak hai to ye intra uterine pregnancy aa jayegi ya mild elevations in beta hcg hue to ka ki badhi jayega and it should it should become an intra uterine pregnancy now serum progesterone should not be used for making a, a diagnosis or either for no, refuting for, uh, for uh, pregnancy of unknown location mri is of doubtful value where will it find it uh, what will it find so it has to be used judiciously in pregnancy of unknown location and we should not rest all our hopes on mri ki mri kara lete pata chal jayega nahi pata chala to dekha jayega we should be very very uh, clingy to this patient that uh, you, you just come to us whenever you find that you are fainting or you are even becoming anxious you come to us so uh, another entity is heterotopic pregnancy a rare but possible in entity it is reported in 1 is to 30000 pregnancy in spontaneous versus 1 is to 3900 art pregnancies always assess adnixa even if intrauterine pregnancy is confirmed so we always ask for report of adnixal comment suspect 
in case of high beta hcg but no multiple pregnancy or uh, mol molar pregnancy is found and you are finding high levels of beta hcg patient is having excessive nausea vomiting you order for beta hcg it, it is coming in high ranges but there is singleton intrauterine pregnancy molar pregnancy bhi nahi hai to thoda sa dekh lena chahiye ki ye heterotopic pregnancy to nahi hai patient might give you fainting episodes along with intrauterine pregnancy always assess adnix and think of it topic and evaluate the so called corpus luteal cyst very carefully because jaise wo uska differential hai ectopic ka ectopic ka corpus luteum ka differential bhi uh, corpus uh, topic pregnancy hai laparoscopic management is gold standard those who wish to conserve their intrauterine pregnancy now bilateral tubal ectopic it is a very rare clinical entity till date i think there are uh, 16 cases which have been reported and uh, it is seen in 1 in 2 lakh intrauterine pregnancies risk factors are same we have case series bhi bahut kam hai case reports hi hai zyada tar and the majority of the times the presentation is one uh, ectopic pregnancy has ruptured and other one is intact management depends on concomitant factors and uh, this was my case report and uh, it was uh, posted in 2018 and we discussed and dissected the literature associated with ectopic pregnancy uh, that is presenting in bilateral tubes now one confusing entity is chronic ectopic uh, upt is positive in only 50% of the cases majority of the cases are having upt negative history of uh, episode of one severe lower abdominal pain after that patient have taken some medication it got relieved and she just forgot about it amenorrhea again may be present or absent there may be sometimes fever rectal tenesmus dyspareunia so if a patient is having vaginal spotting along with fever with rectal tenesmus and reports dyspareunia think of chronic mass that is irritating the rectum and pouch of douglas and in such cases a chronic ectopic it is sometimes an incidental finding on usg to surprise patient and us both and it is usually reported as complex adnexal mass and we have already discussed how to evaluate complex adnexal mass to differentiate it from a chronic ectopic so what is the management methotrexate uh, nahi dete hain chronic ectopic mein because it is not working there we have to do laparoscopic exploration depending on the size and symptoms of the patient and sometimes we can offer serial ultrasound monitoring if a patient may go for spontaneous resolutions also so you have to choose your patient for management but definitely methotrexate is not an option so what are the latest drugs for the management of ectopic pregnancy methotrexate is an age old friend it is not a uh, latest addition to management we give it intramuscular 50 mg oral drug has limited studies for efficacy and not preferred also because we don't want to take any doubts and chances while we are managing an entity known as ectopic single dose regimen is preferable nowadays and toxicity profile has to be understood that it causes severe stomatitis gastritis liver toxicity alopecia and diarrhea to our patients so who are the candidates who are uh, you know fit for medical management of ectopic pregnancy so unruptured ectopics having no significant pain having an unruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy with an adnexal mass smaller than 35 mm with no visible cardiac activity serum beta hcg level less than 1500 and do not have an intrauterine pregnancy and are able to return to follow up so uh, these are the nice guidelines given in 2019 and these have not been updated as per as uh, my latest information i'll check because this thing i did not check but they stand true with the test of time and these are the patients who should be offered for uh, medical management of pregnancy now there are some uh, reports and cases and literature reporting that even with cardiac activity uh, medical management can be tried that becomes a relative contraindication and even with higher levels of serum beta hcg 3000 and in some literature 5000 medical management of a topic has been uh, professed and offered so again it depends on us what guidelines we want to choose what what is our patient's profile and how uh, you know com comfortable we are 
uh, with higher levels of serum beta SCG to offer uh, medical management as the chances of failure are more with increasing levels of beta SCG. So follow up, you can do giving one single intramuscular dose, get beta SCG on days four and five and ask the patient to avoid unprotected vaginal intercourse until beta SCG is undetectable, avoid alcohol, pelvic examination, they may lead to rupture, Food and vitamins containing prolific uh, folic acid, exposure to sunlight because it can cause methotrexate associated dermatitis. NSAIDs because already methotrexate is suppressing bone marrow, they further enhance this effect. And the PCM and tramadol can be really, uh, used for pain relief. Other drugs like direct installation of methotrexate, KCL, hypertonic saline, and hyperosmolar glucose, 15 methyl PGF2 alpha and PGF2 uh, alpha plane uh, into the gestational sac. It can be done, and it can be done under ultrasound. Guidance. Okay, so it can be done under ultrasound guidance and the rates of success are quite good. But then uh, rarely the need should be arising for invasive procedure when we have drugs like methotrexate. And if methotrexate is contraindicated, we can use KCL hypertonic slide a direct installation. Otherwise, this newer drug, letrozole, I mean, not a newer drug, but for this uh, management, we can use that. It has shown promising results in trials given in dose of 5 to 10 milligram OD or BD, however you want to give it. It can be given in combination with methotrexate and combination with methotrexate has shown a better resolution, early resolution, and early de decline in the beta SCG levels. It exerts an anti-estrogenic activity on the placental receptors at the ectopic gestation site. Now, these estrogen receptors are vital for vascular connections, decreasing oxygen, and resoluting uh, the pregnancy. The data has been extrapolated from its use in ab abortion, medical management of abortion. When people saw that it is working excellently in medical management of abortion, the use was extended in trials for ectopic pregnancy and the results are good as far as the uh, clinical results are concerned. Efficacy is similar to methotrexate and obviously with lesser side effects associated with methotrexate, that is an anti-metabolite. Uh, it is uh, acting against actively dividing cells. Letrozole is doing no such harm to uh, the body in total. Another drug that is Jeftinib can be used as an adjunct. It is a type of targeted cancer drug called as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, that is TKI. Tyrosine kinase is a protein that sends signals telling cancer cells to grow. And Jeftinib blocks these signals. For Jeftinib to work, the cancer cells need to have receptors for a protein called epidermal growth factor. And this epidermal growth factor is found in abundance in placenta. And that is why it is working excellently in ectopic pregnancy. But uh, it is just uh, having this trial that is GEM3 trial. The results are maybe in preparation or they are just out. So we this is not yet uh, an approved drug or a wide, widespreadly used drug. But just to add to our knowledge, Jeptinib can be used an, as an adjunct in cases of ectopic pregnancy. A word about expected management. Criteria is clinically stable and pain-free patients. Having a tubal ectopic pregnancy less than 3.5 cm, that is same. No visible cardiac activity on TBS. And serum beta SCG level above 1000 but below 1500. For medical management, we uh, have less than 1500 and below 1500 uh, we should have. And again, uh, they should be able to return to follow up. When we see the results of expectant management, one third of the patients resolve spontaneously. And uh, NICE 2019 guidelines again reiterated that no additional advantage of adding methotrexate in such a level of beta SCG. Rates of dissolution, rupture, and future fertility rates were also similar in which expectant management was tried. So this seems to be a good option in the selected candidates. Obviously, our criteria should be fulfilled. Additionally, beta SCG less than 1000, the success rates are as high as 98%. And only 38% if levels are more than 5000. So that is why 
having lesser beta hcg more so less than 3500 is good for medical management agar falling trends hum already observe kar rahe hain tab apne patient ko expectant ya medical management ke liye rakh rakh hain results will be uh, better if we already see pre treatment changes that is declining trend in beta hcg again the chances are better and the decrease from day 1 to day 4 are the most important ones there uh, we reassure ourselves that this treatment is going to work success rates in these conditions are around 100% as compared to 42 to 60% when there is increase between day 1 and day 4 so this initial fall is very you know uh, confidence boosting for us those who are managing ectopics medical okay so uh, a word about uh, the dosage protocol single dose versus multi dose i think is sabko rata hua hai single dose is methotrexate 50 mg day 1 and serum beta hcg on day 4 and day 7 and we have to see the decline in serum beta hcg level it should be more than 15% from day 4 to day 7 and less than 15% decline during a uh, weekly surveillance agar hai to we have to think of multiple dose or a, uh, add up dose after single dose in multi dose regimen despite anything or everything up to four doses of both the drugs that is uh, methotrexate and ducoprin should be given methotrexate is given as 1 mg per kg on day 1357 And leucoporin 0.1 milligram per kilogram day two four six and eight that is alternate days. And if serum beta hcg level declines by less than fifteen percent, give additional dose and repeat serum beta hcg after two days and compare with previous value. And maximum of four doses should be given. Agar usse nahi ho raha, then we should be resorting for a uh, minimally invasive surgery. Success rates overall eighty nine percent hai. मल्टी डोज से 92.7 परसेंट है सिंगल डोज से 88.1 परसेंट बट प्रेफर्ड इज सिंगल डोज ओइंग टू लेस अमाउंट ऑफ साइड इफेक्ट्स एसोसिएटेड विद सिंगल डोज रेजी एंड ऑलमोस्ट कंपेरेबल रिजल्ट्स मेथोट्रेक्सी डज नॉट डिमिनिश ओवेर एंड रिजॉल्व एंड ड्यूरिंग सिक्स मंथ इफ इवन इफ द पेशेंट गेट्स प्रेग्नेंट देयर आर नो इंक्रीज रेट्स फॉर मिसकैरेज और मेल फॉर्मेशंस और फीटल ग्रोथ रेस्ट्रिक्शन now just to add because this is an update session biochemical markers beta hcg to hai which is available accessible but there are proposed markers for ectopic pregnancy based on biologic functions and maybe they become the talk of the town like progesterone placenta plasma uh, placenta associated plasma protein a sp1 inhibin a egf active in a adam1 but they are unable to differentiate between abnormal intrauterine pregnancy with sufficient accuracy so they are uh their value is of doubt right now but one thing that i wanted to bring to everyone's notice was if a patient is having hemoperitoneum and the diagnosis is in doubt then hemoperitoneum to venous serum beta hcg ratio if it is greater than 1 it can be used as an indicator for immediate diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy with hemoperitoneum so i don't know who finds this utility with this particular statement of finding but one should be doing surgical management offer a salpingectomy that is always better to women undergoing surgery for an ectopic pregnancy until unless they have other risk factors for infertility where we might be thinking of salvaging the tube salpingotomy as an alternative to salpingectomy for women with risk factor for inter, uh, infertility and uh, inform women who are undergoing salpingotomy that up to 1 in 5 women will need further treatment and for women who have had a salpingotomy alone take one 